making a decision for me was not really a decision like a click because click you know like the light goes bulb goes on and off because I grew up in a family where my father my grandmother uh, my uncle one of my uncles uh, and others within the family were uh, unusually uh, linked or felt linked to aspects of the past so that uh, we had some artifacts in the house. We had, for example, my great, great, great somebody's uh, sword that he was given at the end of the French and Indian War. We had uh, we had my great, great grandfather's copy of Uncle Tom's Cabin, which is the first illustrated version. We had uh, Civil War artifacts from uh, another great, great grandfather's service. So, and then my summer is part of my. I was living in Virginia. I grew up in Virginia, Northern Virginia. And virtually every summer, my sister and I were parked at uh, the house in Lancaster, where my the great great grandfather, who uh, was a former congregational retired, well, had been a congregationalist minister, had lived, and where two of his daughters, who were both Spencers, lived. They each lived to be about a hundred, and this was a house that reeked of of history. Uh, obviously, it was a, it was not an ancient house, but it was ancient to me as a seven or eight or nine or ten year old and wandering the streets of Lancaster it was as though Mary Rowlandson had been there just a, a short while before and uh, the Unitarian Congregationalist Schism which uh, was certainly not on most people's minds in the 40s but uh, was intensely real to my to my grandmother who was the most important uh, parental figure in my life my mother had died in, when I was very young and uh, so, uh, and I was dragged to cemetery after cemetery after cemetery, because they were both doing, my grandmother and my father were doing genealogical work, which, in which I took no interest at all. But nonetheless, so historical stuff was all around me. And then when I began to read, which I, in Virginia those days there was no kindergarten, so you started school in first grade, and I was, by the time I was in second grade, I was reading and beginning to read fairly actively. So in our family bookcase were leftovers from various periods of time books that uh, are basically unheard of now, like Jane Porter's The Scottish Chiefs, which was about Robert Bruce and so forth and so on, and Hugo's uh, Les Miserables in, in English, of course, and and uh, so there was a sense that, and I, and I began to read these books, and then as people realized that I liked reading and I liked reading historical stuff, I, every Christmas I would get such books, and I actually bought one recently going on going on Amazon, uh, a fantastic book called The Golden Warrior by a Danish author on Harold of England and his rise and eventual death at Hastings. And I read these and reread re these and, I, and I, I, knew them, I knew them backwards and forwards. Historical fiction I read of all kinds, American, British, European. And so uh, I can't point to a moment, as I say, where this came over me. It just happened. It, it was a seamless in retrospect, a seamless process, and so already in seventh grade, I won a medal, DAR medal, for being knowing more history than anybody else. <laughs> in uh, my senior year in high school, there was a national Hearst newspaper contest in American history, and I came in third in that uh, without any preparation. And, uh, so when I went to college, you know, I knew I wasn't I wasn't going to do math or the sciences or the hard social sciences. A, I had no training in them, and B, I wasn't, didn't feel I had a knack to do them. Uh, I also happened to love literature, so uh, doing an historical major was just the obvious thing to do. And uh, so I never really looked back from there. I, becoming a professor was a bit of a leap in the sense that there were no, no one in my family had been a, an academic. It's true of most families, I think, in those days. But, uh, Aside from dipping my toe into the field of publishing, which I did as an intern at Houghton Mifflin one summer, it was pretty clear that I was going to go on and do, do what I like doing, which is reading and, and writing about history. So, that, so if, I can, if I can use the word romance without all of the implications of that word, I would say that uh, I, really, I really enjoyed going back to the past. I, the other day I was in a house just for a house it was, which had this smell, slightly moldy smell that old houses have. Maybe it was my own house. 
And it was like Proust's mantle, and it came back to me how my great-great-grandfather's house or other family houses I would go to, other places I would go to, dragged willingly or unwillingly, had this smell which curiously was an, intense, an enticing smell. So this was um, just a, a sense that the past was right there, as well as also very different. I mean, to go to this house in Lancaster was, believe me, very different from my Virginia childhood or what was happening around us in my neighborhood or the war or all those sorts of things, which is very, very different. Victorian? I'm sorry? Was it had a Victorian? It was a Victorian house, yeah. It was mm -hmm. a house built probably in the middle of the 19th century. Big, rambling house. And uh, so, uh, as I say, there was no, like, I think like virtually anyone who uh, grows up you know, with this subjective or to, or a term from Raymond Williams, a structure, a feeling about the past. It wasn't critical. I was aware that, uh, I was very aware that there were other views of the past because on my playground in Virginia, we would divide up, this is, will sound bizarre, in 1945, we, would, we, would, we, were, we fought, the boys wrestled on the playground every, every day wouldn't, in ways that would now be considered scandalous. <laughs> And one group were called Yankees, one group were called Rebs, and for some reason I was always joining the Yankee part. It was just, I had to be a Yankee. And uh, so in that sense I was aware that in Alexandria where I grew up there was the statue of the Confederate soldier and my, my parents were not into the Confederacy in the least. And uh, although I actually had ancestors who fought on the side of the Confederacy. Uh, so, so I was aware that there were, and then there was the religious aspect of my bringing up where I was a grew up in an anti-Catholic family, a Presbyterian family. But, um, but, I, but of course, it wasn't only after college that I understood what critical history was in the sense of comparing sources. And, and I was very, very fortunate to have that hit me strongly the very first year I was in college and have some terrific teachers who, who showed me what, what that is. And I'm always aware that when I'm teaching undergraduates, that sense of uh, penetrating be behind the obvious is not something that's a given, not even a given in coming out of the best of high schools. On the other hand, this uh, sort of uh, rap romance of the past is certainly not a given, and it can't be taught in some ways. I, I think it's something that, I don't mean to mystify it, but if you take a spectrum of people, people have it and others don't have it. and. Uh, at any rate, that's my, my story, and um, I would add to that that my, after I got out of college, by phenomenal stroke of luck, because I shouldn't have been given this fellowship, I got a Fulbright to go to France. I shouldn't have been given because I was studying American history and literature, but I did get a Fulbright to go to France, and I, it was the first time I got to Europe. And my family was very British-centric, centric, Anglo-centric. And I became the great exception of the Francophile, which I remain passionately to this day. And so that was another, uh, of course, to go to Europe is to encounter a much richer past and a past which in some ways is more present in France to this day than, than our past, which is really obscured by consumerism in so many ways and, and other things. So being in France then and a lot since really, uh, gave me a powerful reinforcement to really love this journey where you pass cross out of the present into something else, or perhaps better, you're part of a mixed milieu, so that where the past is always there somewhere around the corner or embedded in what you're eating and drinking. There's a terrific museum in Paris that most people don't know about called the Arts and Traditions, Popular Arts and Traditions, where there's a set of exhibits which show a room with a you know, a dried hunk of cheese and a piece of hard bread and a piece of dried meat. And in France today, you're eating dried meat, bread, softer bread, and cheese. And that, of course, was for a millennium, the way people served meat, cheese, and then they had bread if they were lucky. You sense, you sense this extraordinary continuity in France. Uh, and the French themselves, many of them feel this without talking about it. I mean, it's, they just are aware that it is part of their, of what being French is. Of course, that can take bad directions as well as good. But that's one of the reasons I 
I, I relished going to, to France, the shock of getting out outside my American skin, but on the other hand, the pleasure of entering a society where pieces of the past are always embedded present. You can visibly present in the, in the now and in the, in the everyday.